Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on the Seeds of Liberty dot com and the Conscious Resistance dot com. Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the Bipcot No Gov license. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for that at bipcot.org. So today we have Jim Limber Davis uh, coming in from Indiana, right? Yep, Indiana. Indiana. His main website is jimlimberdavis.com. His Facebook page is Liberty Defined. And he wrote two ebooks, Liberty Defined and Morality Defined. You can find him on Twitter at Jim Limber Davis, on Steam It under Jim Limber Davis. He keeps it he keeps it consistent. And so today we're not gonna talk about his books. We talked about his books in the past interviews. Today we're gonna delve into the murky waters of a philosophical conversation. We're gonna talk about self ownership, basic definitions, and how it can be applied to practical life everyday situations why is it relevant why do we need to talk about it i certainly talk about it a lot and so does he so we might we may not see exactly eye to eye but that's what these discussions are great for we can iron these things out so jim thanks a lot for coming back on the show oh absolutely i'm i'm glad to help out yeah yeah no problem so yeah let's start off with self-ownership a basic definition so how would you define self-ownership? Somebody comes up to you, you know, they, they never heard of the, the uh, liberty philosophy, and, uh, and you, you mentioned self-ownership. How do you define it? Well, if I'm going to define it in a way that people can understand, something that they can take away in the moment and actually apply that to their everyday life, I'm going to say, in, in essence, in a nutshell, and this is a very crude way of putting it, and not very refined, it's going to be, Basically, you homestead yourself. So long as you're refining your time, intellect, and labor to maintain your life and improve its quality, then you're in control and you own yourself. So in a nutshell, that's all it is. Yeah, so so I remember you mentioning how – talking about a child said that – like you, you define the childhood, child as being the property of the the parents. But right. you know, most people would look down on that definition, like what parents own their children? No, that's not true. But you're like, and then the way you describe it, if I'm if I have it correct, you say over time, the child as they gain certain skills and independence, they gain more and more ownership over their lives until mm -hmm. eventually they can become self reliant. In which case, they have full self ownership. And you know, I, I wouldn't put it in those ter those words in those terms, but I would say pretty much the exact same thing that we gain self ownership slowly through the acquisition of of various life skills and knowledge about the world. Being parents, you know, the parents that we have, there it's their duty, right, to protect us and to give us as much skills as possible, right? There's some skills they can't. You learn on your own or through experience or through uh, through reading books, things like that. And so, yeah, self ownership, the way I would describe it, very basic, very basically put to, you know, the layman, let's say on the street, would be mm -hmm. um, that you are 100% responsible and accountable for your actions, right? Mm -hmm. So you cannot blame your actions on another person. Now, <laughs> it's very interesting. Let me just explain a little bit of a recent example I had. I, I have a tough time with, with one family member. <laughs> She's very emotional and uh, she got very angry at me and she was even violent in the sense of breaking things. And then she wanted me to say sorry, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't getting violent, I wasn't getting emotional, and I wasn't getting angry. And I basically described self-ownership to her. I said, you have to understand that you are 100% responsible for your actions, as just as I am 100% responsible for my actions, right? If somebody, let's say I go to a store, and they say something that I didn't like, I don't have the right to destroy property, right? Uh, like in the store, and then say that that person offended me, or insulted me with their words, right? So... You are 100% responsible for your actions, right? So in, in, in the same way, you can never blame another person for the actions that you have committed, that you have taken, right? And one um, example with uh, Walter Black I remember uh, listening to where we say, like, if you take a gun and you kill someone and they say, you know, you're a murderer, you should go to jail. And, and then you say, no, 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 I didn't kill him. The bullet killed him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we understand 
that you know the gun is just a machine, right, an inanim- inanimate object, mm-hmm. and the the whole reason that it shot was because we pulled the trigger. And why did we pull the trigger? Because our brain, our mind, told our body pull the trigger, right? So ultimately, mm-hmm. you know, in that case, we're always responsible for action. So I don't know if that's a long convoluted, <laughs> but that's my answer. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it 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 still works with practical application that I put forward. Um, like I said, what I put forward is very crude because there's some other things that need to be understood. Uh, but everything that everything I base self ownership on, everything I base liberty on, everything morality that I that I talk about is always going to be going back to those two uh, books that I wrote. So what you relate, I think, still works uh, very much. So uh, I think the issue is going to be in getting into. So if I ask. What is the foundation of self-ownership, which I did a few weeks ago, and I put through a bunch of different social media groups, and I got a lot of answers. So just some of the answers I I put through were they asked me a rhetorical question that said, what is the foundation of slavery? Well, it's the opposite, or what is self-ownership? It's existing, or the same thing that morality is founded upon, property rights. Self-ownership is a property right, or you and you alone control your body. You have the greatest claim to it. All sorts of things, and mm-hmm. then I get then then I started getting these answers about it's your soul, it's you think, and then a handful of people put in there, oh, it's about you having exclusive control over over your own actions, mm-hmm. and then somebody posted something about Stefan Molyneux's UPB stuff in there, and anyway, so not most not a lot of people get it, and I think a lot of it is a lot of it is rooted in just not understanding. What it is that is being asked. So I don't. I, I don't think people distinguish between knowing difference between self ownership and knowing what. Or let me rephrase that. People don't distinguish between knowing of self ownership. Like they might hear of the idea, but I don't think they really think about it. And in terms of what it really is, where it's derived from, and, and how it how it's maintained. And I, I think that becomes a real problem with it. So. What we presented, even what uh, even what Stefan Molyneux presented, it still holds because it gives you some place to start working with. But if, if people don't go all the way into that, I don't think that they are going to really start to grasp that uh, all the other answers that I was given here, such as uh, it's the foundation of, of property rights. But if I were to expand upon what I had stated earlier, self ownership is going to be the first boundary of interaction with other individuals. Basically, it's it, self ownership applies to people who can invoke these these concepts, who can understand these concepts and the, what their purpose is. And of course, their purpose, self ownership, is is to set that boundary so that other people know where they need to stop interacting with you at. That way, you can avoid unnecessary uh, transgressions and and things like that. So, if it might be perfectly fine for me to go up and and put my put my arms on 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 my significant other, but it, it would probably be really weird if I came up and just put my hand on your butt. Um, <laughs> it might make you a little uncomfortable. So we have to set those boundaries, and self-ownership is the first one. And then when you understand self-ownership being all about controlling yourself in the philosophical sense and then maintaining your maintaining that control by refining your time, your intellect, and labor to produce the real wealth necessary to satisfy sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness – so long as you are the sole provider for that, taking absolute responsibility like you were saying, then it ends up being – you can translate that into a further further concept, getting into morality and, and a non-aggression principle and, and a further boundary. So that's, uh, that's where I would have taken it if I were to have write, written a book just on self-ownership alone. All right. I I talked to a I had a debate with this guy Todd Lewis. I don't know if you heard it. He's a Christian distributist. He described himself as, and I didn't really know what that was before I talked to him. But one of the things that he had issue with regarding self ownership was he says all these libertarians and uh, anarcho capitalists or anarchists say that they own themselves, and and he's like that's impossible because ownership is if you own a chair. You're not the chair. You own the chair, and you can break the chair. You can give it away. You can do whatever you want with it, but you're not the chair. And so if you say you own your body, how do you separate the mind from the body? <laughs> and I thought that was an interesting semantical type uh, argument. It didn't really 
put in much any doubts. I mean, and I just said, you know, maybe it's it's a different it's a different type of ownership. But to me, it's it's the same. Actually, it, it is kind of you know. Now that I think about it, you know, without the mind, the body is just really a shell, an mm-hmm. inanimate object <laughs> shell, right? It's it's really the conscious mind that that gives it animation and life, right? Mm-hmm. So in a sense, I guess you could say we are <laughs> like a chair, and uh, and so. Um, but, but still, you know, you know, still, I, I still maintain self-ownership. I still think it's a valid concept and, and from which, you know, property rights and volunteerism stems from. So, mm-hmm. and, and that's the, yeah, that's real, the real foundation for the, for the, for the entire philosophy in, in my, the way I look at it. Uh, I've heard that before the, the argument where, or the idea anyway, about, uh, separating mind from body and. Maybe maybe we are just like the chair because if we're refining our time, our intellect, and our labor to go in and, and gather the, the wood pieces in order to shape them and to create a chair, we're refining our time, intellect, and labor to create something of real wealth, something that satisfies our, our desire for sustenance, shelter, security, or happiness or enables greater pinnacles of our successes in achieving those things. So. Maybe it is just the mind that's claiming ownership over the body because without the body, the mind has no vessel to travel. And I don't know. Right. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not into the spiritual stuff. I mean, <laughs> I, I celebrate Yule, Yuletide instead of Christmas. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if anybody wants to invoke the spiritual stuff, they're more than welcome to. But I try to steer away from that because you, it's very difficult to prove or disprove something. Or to invoke to use something that you can't prove or, or disprove exists or doesn't exist, and I it's just it's it's very it, it it's almost like it's an it's a trap. I think uh, intellectually speaking, I, I just I rather stay away from that. But I think it would be fair to say that if we take care of our bodies, then okay, we are like the chair. Yeah, is it isn't that you know when you when you said you can't disprove something, it's it's not falsifiable. I I I, I believe that's the term for that. Where it's like if you tell somebody you have a uh, an invisible spiders on your head, and you say where and you say we can't see it, and you go to touch it, well you can't touch it either. And you, you say well I don't smell anything, you can't smell it either. <laughs> How do you know it's there? <laughs> um, right. So that's isn't that what's called? Like, it, it lacks falsifiability. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think that's I think that's right. Uh, something it's like a statement or something that that's an inherent possibility, but you can't really prove it. Like you could say there's there's absolutely no pink and green unicorns or whatever in the world <laughs> or in the universe. But unless you go to every single star system and turn over every single All rock, right. it's really, I don't know. Maybe something like that. I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> I don't like invoking those sorts of things. There, I, I rather, I rather be able to show a tr- a clear, transparent path of thought progression, starting with the goal. So, if you're going to invoke something, a concept in which it's going to be used to interact with other people or justify punishing other people, then the concept has to be clear. Uh, the goal has to be abs- has to be absolutely clear. Everything has to be universally applicable to everybody else. And I think with what we describe the self ownership to start with. I think that's universally applicable for everybody. So it'd be easy to to say, okay, look, I own myself, you own yourself. These unless we're changing the way we're going to interact with one another. Okay, but to say that self ownership just exists because some mystical being says it does, I I, I don't know. I I want to know why it does. I don't want to just oh, accept it for what it is. And that's something that, that really gets gets to me where a lot of people will say things like, um, oh, it's, it's self-ownership is axiomatic. It's it's self-evident or it's it's just inherent. And then I ask them, I say, OK, well, why is it axiomatic and inherent and self-evident? And then and then I go and I look these words up and, and oh, okay, axiomatic, it means according to dictionary.com, it'll say something like it's inherent. Or, or it's self-evident. Oh, okay, well then, well, what do those words mean? It, it, it just <laughs> exists because it exists in there, or it doesn't need proof of being of being in existence. It just it, all you have to do is look, and you can see the proof. But mm. if if we all owned ourselves, and all we had to do is look, and it's that obvious, well then, why is there government ruling over everybody else if it was that obvious? And I so, so I, I don't like 
I don't like that approach too much where, where people get into that. And then, and then they end up invoking the, the spiritual stuff. I have no problem if people want to invoke that stuff for their own thing, so long as it doesn't inter- inter- interfere in my life mm-hmm. uh, negatively or positively. And people, and that's the killer. People, I'll tell people that, and they'll just, what do you mean, or positively? I thought you want good stuff to happen. Yeah, I, I do. But if the good stuff happens into my life because somebody invoked something that can't be proven or disproven, then that gives them wiggle room, the grounds to invoke something that I don't want to have happen in my life. So I'd rather not go that route at all with explaining something that I think should be universally applicable to everybody. And we were talking before we started the recording about about the character that I have on my uh, profile a lot of times. Well, that's uh, Tom Baker, the fourth doctor. And one of the things that – one of my favorite uh, things that was said in an episode was that uh, he says, to the rational mind, nothing is inexplicable, only unexplained. Hmm. And I – have never forgotten that. I, I keep that around. So when I ask these people if something is, why is it axiomatic? Why is it inherent? Why is it self-evident? Why is it any of these things? Most of the time, people just they either get mad, or and tell me to expletive expletive off, or <laughs> or they go read a book, or they'll cite natural law, and then it's something that can't be proven, which is something that I'll get into. On my own, on my own ch- uh, channels and pages about breaking that down, but mm-hmm. but yeah, no, I having a clear goal, a transparent path of thought progression from the goal all the way to the means makes everything so much easier. I think that way, if you if you know what the goal is, then you can set parameters to invoke. In which case, you can use those parameters to define your means, and if you can, and if your means violate. Or don't work within the parameters that you create, and end up being inconsistent with the goal. Then you know what you have to do. You have to change the means. But if you don't have that clear foundation of of what self ownership is, then which, which then I will argue leads to the creation and and, and, and uh, enactment of morality. Uh, the non aggression principle being the neutral base of that, leading to non aggression as your neutral base, morality as your positive, and immorality as your negative. Then you can't create a clearly desi- a defined set of parameters and, and means in order to apl- employ, and then everybody starts doing all sorts of crazy stuff like invoking a social contract, and and then they start invoking government, and then everybody's in everybody's spaces, and then then it's just hostility all around, and that's just that's terrible. You know, you, you remind me of a uh, a common scenario that people give to me when I talk about self ownership. And, you know, and uh, the possibility of a voluntary society and they say, well, so, so, um, you know, you say everyone's self, everyone has a self ownership and everyone's hundred percent accountable and responsible for their lives. Mm-hmm. Well, what, what if a crazy person, like somebody who is obviously doesn't have control over their body and they do some horrible things, they rob people, they can kill people. Mm-hmm. What do you do with them? You know, how do you, how do you treat them like a, like a person that has a hundred percent um, control, do you punish them in the same way that a regular person, if a regular person did those acts? And, and you know, I'd like to tell people that these concepts are just that. They're concepts, they're principles, they're guidelines for life. And I think they're not intended to give a uh, clear cut black and white answer to every single possible human situation <laughs> that we can find ourselves in. And it's kind of funny that status often require that we do give them every single possible detail of how it would work. And yet so much of the reality goes, they're ignorant of so much of what goes on today, but they want to know, you know, how, how would a, how would a voluntary society deal with somebody like that? And, and sometimes, you know, I can give them my answer, but sometimes I like to say, you know what? I don't know. Let's figure it out. (laughs) You know, maybe every situation is different. There's every crazy person. There's a different situation, different group of people. They react differently. They come up with their own solution. That's not a reason to support a a monopoly on arbitration, right? And Mm -hmm. courts, right? (laughs) Clearly not. So, so yeah. So I'm just curious as to your, your thoughts on that. I'm actually really excited. You, you brought that up. I'll spare you all the details of all the things that I screamed at the wall in the shower while thinking about this uh, <laughs> earlier today. So, no, okay. So, do you like watching um, television shows? 
Uh, me. You ever you mm, ever watch any television shows? Have you? Have, I mean, I have, them? but not lately. <laughs> do you read? Do you read science fiction or, or or fiction at all? No, I'm I'm not. I do not like fiction. I'm more of a you know a philosophy. Okay, economics. we're done. I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. We're done. You don't read. That, 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 that's one to the heart right there. That's that's one to the heart. I'm to, going uh, to me to me. You know the, the saying, "Reality is stranger than fiction." Like I I would rather spend the limited time and resources I have uh, alive knowing or trying to figure out you know um you know the, these kinds of things in reality then 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 descend into the imagination of a person but that's just me well, that's, <laughs> that's the just, great that's part <laughs> though because if you think about it all of the stuff that, that that's been science fiction once upon a time is now science reality right and right. so getting back to your question <laughs> so so my partner and i we've been watching uh, supernatural uh we we like to binge watch shows on on on, on various platforms and mm -hmm. the re most recent one we're we're watching the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And so it actually plays right into your question because a lot of the shows revolve around uh, demonic possessions where a mm -hmm. demon takes over an individual. So again, so you can see maybe where this is going, where the individual is no longer in control of their actions. But the moment the two main characters figure out what's going on, they have they have the good hunter, they have the bad hunter scenario. The good hunter being the younger brother, he's more compassionate. No, there's there's a person in there. We need to free the person. We need to we, once they realize that's what's going on, that's what they do. They they free the they free the person. And it doesn't matter whether it's a demonic possession or if it's some sort of virus or disease, like in the most recent episode we just watched, where there was this werewolf issue where it was causing the person uh, in question to to not be able to control their actions, and so they tried all sorts of other things. But it's going to be dependent on the context of the situation. So even if these, even if 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 just because uh, and what was the there was a I think it was Arthur C. Clarke or somebody said something about um, uh, magic is just science we don't understand yet or, or something like that. And I think that, yeah. that a lot of people forget that there's always a reason. And just like just like with the doctor, to the rational mind, nothing is inexplicable, only unexplained. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of getting the context of the information together and mm -hmm. being able to think as quickly as fast, as quickly as possible, uh, define concepts, uh, understand process information being given to you, and then to work from there. Because the way I set up my moral philosophy and morality defined. If any, whoever, if you've read that, if people listening have read that, uh, they'll know that it's applicable to all reason-capable, sentient beings able to communicate at least complex uh, concepts with one another, at least complex enough to understand the setting of boundaries for the purpose of the preservation of one another's lives. And that's something that if we take that into consideration, then we can break – we can break down all context. We can think about a way of, of, of helping people and, and, and protecting and saving them or whatever it is that we can do with them. But we can do that right now, take your question, alter it a little bit, and then we can get into that, – that, that brings up the question of, well, what do we do about comatose people? Mm -hmm. Do they still own, their, own, their, own themselves? Mm -hmm. right. Well, it depends on – it depends on a lot of things. Do they have loved ones who are willing to take care of them? Mm. Did they set themselves up financially so that they, they, they sign contracts? Did they have health insurance that did X, Y, or Z to provide for them? There's all sorts of things that people can do to maintain uh, control over their self-ownership because what's going to happen is once they have once they've set all these things in motion and something happens to them, and they can no longer physically care for themselves like they were before. So like if they were able to set up a fat bank account, now they have the money to be able to pay for everything that they need and they can still maintain themselves because they took all of their time, intellect, and labor before whatever happened to put them in a state of, 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 of a comatose state or a, a means that they couldn't provide for themselves as like they used to to where now they have everything and saved. They took all that, all that wealth, turned it into stores of, of, of labor, uh, money. Uh, currency, and now have that, and that's what's going to keep them uh, keep them okay. So, but yeah, to, to answer your question, it's just about understanding the context, finding out what's going on. Yeah. So, so these these very sticky and obscure 
scenarios, they don't invalidate the principles, right? They just, you know, because again, the principles are just guidelines, right? It's not, it's not a substitute for thinking. It's not like a, a manual. You, you know, you look at page, know if page principles, but I don't. I mean, guidelines. I don't. I don't know if they would be guidelines per se. But okay, I mean, I, I see where you're going with it, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, I mean, it's actually the same way I, I describe parenting and peaceful parenting. You know, I say I'm not telling you how to parent. I'm just giving you these principles that I live by and that I think they're consistent uh, and um, and logical and um, moral. And you can choose to abide by them or not. Or, or and also they're not a they're not a manual like <laughs> every parent wants a manual. Like, what do I do if my child does X? You know, turn to page fifty three mm-hmm. and it's going to say what you should do. <laughs> and and that's kind of and also the same thing with volunteerism. I think it's more a I think it's a descriptive philosophy, not a prescriptive philosophy, right? So it, it describes reality, but it doesn't tell you how to act, right? It doesn't tell you you know you can still be you can still be a pretty mean person. And live according to volunteers' principles. <laughs> you know, live your whole life not aggressive against somebody, but you can you can still be a pretty mean person. So it's not to say that you're a really nice person. It's just to say that you're not aggressing against somebody. You know, if if you're abiding by these principles. So they're very basic. It's a skeleton way of thinking about the world that most people have not thought about because we have lived so long with this poisonous idea of the state that these people have this exemption to morality that we all are subject to. So yeah, so that's that, that's kind of um you know the way I describe a volunteerism it's not it's not a manual of how to act, how to live your life. We're not telling you how to live. We're just saying ba- don't do these things. <laughs> Very basic things, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. All right, that makes sense. So that makes sense. I I mean yeah, it's not a manual. I, that I definitely agree with. I don't think uh I wouldn't say it's, 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 it's I wouldn't call it as loose as something as, as guidelines would come across, but uh, I do understand the point. It, it makes sense because the, we all have a canvas to paint on. We all we all get a canvas. Some of us get a bigger canvas than others, depending on whatever whatever genetic codes uh, delta certain certain hands to mm. play with or whatever. But uh, how we paint that canvas is, is, is the difference. But you said you said something about about people being mean and still being living by the voluntary philosophy. And that's interesting. So that came up that, – that comes up a lot with people, and it's a very either-or scenario, I think, where people are – people start talking about this, and then they get into this, well, if you're not doing this, then you're immoral, or if you're not doing that, then you're – or if you're doing this, then you're moral, but if you're doing that, you're immoral. And a lot of people take things to be mean or immoral – when they're not really mean or immoral, they're just amoral. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it's very difficult to get people out of that mindset. Uh, I mean, everybody struggles with this because you know, it's having to deprogram yourself from what you were taught as a kid. Unless you were lucky and you were one of Danilo's kids, you're not going to be, or or, or my daughter, but she's twelve and sassy. So, <laughs> but in order to break that programming. It's very difficult, and we still a lot of people get stuck in this in this either or concept, and and that's a, that's the thing with the non-aggression principle. A lot of people start, well, how do you handle this? How do you handle that? I have this trouble with my partner sometimes, where she gets into the the mindset of, well, we've got to do something about it. We got to save these people. We can't. And I tell her it's a really crappy world sometimes because people don't make the time to do what is absolutely necessary before they start with the hostilities. They don't mm-hmm. make the time to sit down and talk. Mm-hmm. and hash out ideas they don't want to be bothered with that so then hostility ends up being the answer so they so people never realize that the non-aggression principle is your neutral foundation of all morality at least as i lay it out in, in my philosophy and then anything anything that protects life but not necessarily promotes it ends up falling under the, the non-aggression the neutral the neutral foundation there and then comes all the bad stuff so if you do something that intentionally is meant to hurt life at least the life that it, it that this code is supposed to be applicable to then it's immoral but if you do anything to promote it it's moral mm-hmm. and then you have morality is what all of this all all of these concepts are but then you have your it's moral positive then non-aggression, neutral, and then and then immoral is the negative. And I think a lot of people miss that 
that middle point there, and everything ends up being that either or scenario, which is which is really difficult, especially when going all the way back to the self ownership. There, people are just, well, then somebody should help me pay my bills, or somebody should help help me fend me off from these wolves, or somebody should help stop this robber. No, if 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 you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, make somebody uh, responsible for that, then you basically enslave them. To helping other people, society with that moral code then is enslaved to itself because mm-hmm. now they have to take care of everybody. And I don't think people have looked at that enough. I, I just don't p- think people have, have taken enough time for that. And then you brought up the the owning your children, and this plays right into that. Where how much, how many resources does it take to raise a child? Lots of resources. So. The child absolutely needs to be recognized as property of the parent because mom and dad refine their time, intellect, and labor, making the beast with two backs. You know, somewhere, whether it was in the back of their car or in a cheap motel, <laughs> they did that and brought 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 us into the world. They then then they were kind enough in order to invest their time, intellect, and labor to provide for us to give us all these resources because. I would argue up until we're about possibly four to eight years old, where most of us are going to be absolutely dependent on someone to take care of us. We can't do anything. Now, I say four to eight years old because most most of us, unless this was, say, like you know, 150 years ago out on a farm in the Midwest somewhere or wherever in the world where – you know, five-year-olds, they were up at five and six o'clock in the morning with mom and dad out there taking care of chickens and cows and stuff like that. And then the older they got, you know, I mean, that's – it depends on how they you work with your kids, I think, and, and teach them these skills. But they're always going to be dependent on you up until a certain point, and then, then they'll take over providing for themselves. So I don't know. It's, it's – there's a lot of stuff to talk about <laughs> pertaining to this, and – it's probably too much for a single hour, I think. Yeah, 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 probably. But uh, one thing you did describe, you did uh, remind me of is a recent conversation with a family member who uh, who does listen to my occasionally my, my interviews and my, my and read my articles. And she said, you know, Danila, you, all you talk about is philosophy and theoretical stuff and morality. Oh, you're so boring. <laughs> oh. and, 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 and she was saying this because... Like she was asking what what I thought about Trump and and what's going on in the current events. I don't know Hillary Clinton and her email scandal and all that. And I, and I say I focus on, you know, I said I focus on these things: philosophy, morality, economics. And she's like, "But those are just theoretical. They're out there. They're in the abyss. They're ephemeral. You sh- this is reality. We live in reality." And I said, "Yeah, exactly. And what what's your philosophical basis? How do you operate? How do you act? We all have a basis, a moral basis, a philosophical basis that we act upon, and that's what I'm curious about because you're not going to change reality by just talking about reality. You change it by changing people's paradigms, the way they think, right? Their principles that, that, by which they live. You know, that's Absolutely. that's the that's the crux of it. That's the core, right? Uh, you know, you you just you just focus on what's happening in reality and it's like you're just trimming, you know, you're just trimming the branches. <laughs> Of the problem, and, and who uh, what was it? Eleanor Roosevelt uh, said, uh, "You know, we, you know, she says, how many people talk about current events and and great and uh, you know, great minds talk about what is it? Um, uh, I forget. <laughs> Common people talk about other people, right? right. Uh, more uh, more uh, wiser minds talk about ideas and concepts, or something like that. Something like that, right? 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 Yeah. So, so this is why I do focus on this stuff. I think it's paramount. You know, if you right. don't, if you don't understand." You know, you have all these problems in your life and you're like, why do I have all these problems? All right, let's figure out what is your morality? What are your principles? What do you live by? What do you feel passionate about? That's what I want to know. That's what's important they, to maybe me. Maybe these people just want to have their lives be like a special victims unit uh, <laughs> episode, you know, where it's like, well, we got to figure out why he did this. Well, there's my moral code. This is exactly why I did it. Yeah. Problem solved. Yeah. You know everything. I mean, that would that would make for a very, very boring case of law and order, but <laughs> – you know, right, <laughs> right, right. So we're, uh, I think, w- w- you, what you and I are doing, what a lot of other people in the liberty movement, like Sterling Lujan, are doing, are are really out to figuratively attack the root 
of the problem, right? Which is the the philosophical and moral foundation that many yes. people live by. And and one one other thing that you reminded me of when you're talking about um, amoral actions is uh, is the, the the thought experiment of if, if you're walking uh, past a lake and you see somebody drowning and you keep going. Is that an immoral act, right? And I think most people would say, yes, that's an immoral act, right? And we would say, no, that's amoral. You don't have any obligation to act, right? Or if you see somebody being mugged, do you have an obligation to intervene? Not necessarily, right? You're not being immoral. You are being kind of, uh, you know, let's say you have time in the day and you could do something. Hey, you, are, you are being a kind of a jerk if you don't try to help, but you're not really being an immoral person being that you, you could be punished, you know, uh, uh, you know, immorality right. being theft, assault, rape, and murder, you could be punished for walking by. No, that would be ridiculous. Yeah, well, I lay that case out. The sa same scenario, just I just, in, in, in my book, I lay it out, but I do it with a, a stranded motorist on the side of the road instead of instead of someone drowning. L less dramatic, but uh, okay, we'll go with the dramatic part. <laughs> so if, 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 honestly, if, if, if I were to stop and jump into the lake, is it really going to be, oh my God, thank you, you saved me? Or is it going to be like uh, Will Smith's uh, Hancock movie where it's like, ma'am, is it okay? May I touch you, get you out of harm's way? <laughs> like, you don't know. I mean, right. you don't have time to talk to these people. Of course, in the moment, the person's probably going to be like, oh my God, save me. Yeah. But what, what do I get in return for spending and refining my time, my intellect, and my labor to swim out into this lake? What if, what if it's three miles out? Mm, right. what, what if it's just a few feet out? What do I get? I this person would be indebted to me for whatever we agree upon. Mm -hmm. But most people would say, no, you sick expletive. You don't get anything. It's your moral <laughs> obligation. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you just enslaved me to go around being a superhero. Right. Now, if that's the case, then by that logic, law enforcement should do this without getting paid. <laughs> I'm just exactly. saying if, if, their, if their job is to serve and protect the common people, then they should do that without getting paid. So, <laughs> Where's the where's the clarity of the goal needing to be achieved? Where's the where's the where's the uh, the, the, the parameter set in order to which to derive a means in order to achieve that goal? Where is that? Mm -hmm. And this is it, it's it's crazy that that people don't understand this. So I'm a, I'm a I've been a trainer and a, and a teacher for a long time. I've been teaching stuff since I was 16 and 17 years old. Uh, various things, every everything from from simple martial arts uh, when I was younger, uh, all the way to kitchen management and training, and now uh, with the warehouse job that I have. One of the things I bring up to people, I ask them, I say, "Who here was ready for a math test?" And <laughs> most people are like, "What? We're, we're just here to learn how to drive a forklift." Okay, well, what's the square root of sixteen? And most people will tell me, "You know, it's four. And then they're like, "Okay, that was easy." Why? Why is the square root of 16 4? And then if you don't understand the foundation of the multiplication division used to make that so, then you have an issue. It's easy to punch numbers and do a calculator, but if you don't understand the process, we have an issue. It's like, okay, so how many people learned multiplication and division? How many people learned that by memorizing the facts? Or did the teacher stop and tell you, like, well, if you have if you have uh, three times six, and you're going to get eighteen out of that, how many people understand that it's three groups of six singles that you can break those six singles apart and count them up and get and get your answer? How many people understand that? Then how many people understand? And I'll ask these people. I'll say, well, what what do you need to know before multiplication and division? And this, okay, addition and subtraction. Well, how many people understand that multiplication and division is just a faster way to add and subtract? much bigger quantities how many people understand that and then how many people i will ask them i say well why do we add and subtract well what kind what i will say what do you need to know before you add and subtract and they'll say okay counting okay so so what do we need to know before counting mm -hmm. uh your numbers how to label your numbers now this seems very simple to a lot of people and, and pretty absurd but here's where it gets really interesting why do we label quantities? Why do we do that? It's all about organization. Why do we organize? To control. And we need to control certain things in order to do what? Maintain and improve the quality of our lives. Why is this what why does this make sense and why does this why does this apply to pretty much everything that we do?
because it's about maintaining and improving the quality of our lives, whether it be the purpose of, of going the speed limit on certain roads, whether it be using three points of contact uh, when climbing up and down ladders, whether it be using a seat belt, what's the purpose of a seat belt, or setting out your moral foundation or your moral code with a clear goal and a transparent path of thought progression from how you're going to get from where you're at now to achieve that goal. And a lot of people don't understand to break that down. So then when you go all the way back to the self-ownership issue, people are just like, well, it's just inherent. It's like, um, <laughs> nope, I, I need I need more than that. I, I want to understand. And that probably just got way off the topic. But. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah, so so you mentioned that yeah that that you're you're not satisfied with with that answer, you know, of, that it's self evident, that it's natural law, that it's inherent. So I, I don't I don't know if you did say did did you say what 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 are you looking to to hear? Like what, what is your idea that that would satisfy that question? That instead of saying self evident or natural law. Well, natural law is something that, like I said, I was going to get into, and I'm going to actually break that down and and why I disagree with majority of what natural law is being promoted out there at another time, but natural law in, most of the time seems to invoke something that cannot be proven or disproven. Uh, uh, usually it resides on something like some spiritual thing. Oh, right, and right, right. Okay. I, that, if, if you're going to, if, if anybody's going to invoke that, then basically you're invoking obedience to something that we can't prove or disprove, mm -hmm. which then gives somebody who has a real good, a real silver tongue the ability to control the masses. Mm -hmm. And when people don't understand how to break down concepts like I did with, with, with understanding the importance of mathematics, mm -hmm. then it becomes a problem. Inherent, self-evident, axiomatic. I'm just not, I'm not satisfied with those uh, mainly because, mainly because it says an axiom would be something like it's a, a self-evident truth that requires no proof. Well, or a universally accepted principle. Okay. Well, if it's a self-evident truth that requires no proof, why doesn't it require proof? What's what's the purpose? Well, the purpose tends, ends up being something along the lines of because this God said so or it's just – that's just the way things are. Mm -hmm. But if it ends up being something that's universally accepted, well, we own ourselves but we don't own ourselves. How is it that if we can own ourselves but we don't fully own ourselves because a group – a majority of people can come in and just say – Give us this money. We're going to collectively pull resources to create infrastructure and education, whether you like it or not. You don't have kids. Don't care. Put your money in the pot. I, I mean, wh th there, there's so much room there that so much inconsistency. So if I own myself, who has the right to come to me and say you have to do this? So majority, there's no clarity in the foundation of where that comes from, which is why I like the the, the idea that you presented it because it meshes really well with what I said. Which is probably somebody's going to come up with, oh, that's some sort of logical fallacy, I'm sure. But if we can prove, if we say, okay, well, I maintain, I'm responsible for all of my actions. I refine my time, my intellect and labor for it. Okay, now we have the homesteading example. We have the homesteading uh, method here. Okay, at least I'm not infringing upon anybody else's ability to not do this for themselves. And I'm definitely not saying somebody else has to has to come up and do something for me. I'm doing everything for myself. So that's I, I want I want that I want everything to be perfectly clear. I don't want to leave any room open for interpretation where somebody can come in and sneak in and play linguistical ninja tricks with <laughs> the way things work. And and that's really what's happened with with the federal government in the last uh, 150 years since Lincoln's uh, immoral and uh, absolutely unnecessary war. Yeah. Yes. So, so one thing that you uh, reminded me of was another way to describe voluntarism. You know, besides the self ownership and property rights and non aggression. You know, another way was well, don't hit and don't steal. It's a basic way to describe voluntarism. And then another, even more vague way than that, is to say do what you want and accept the consequences. And I think that kind of pleasantly sums it up. And when someone says to you like it's natural law, it's self evident, it's axiomatic. Yeah, or somebody says, you know, I didn't sign the non-aggression principle. You know, the same way we say, I didn't sign the social contract or, or the constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, they say, I didn't sign the non-aggression principle, so why do I have to abide by it? And the answer is, you don't. You, you really don't. You know, you do what you want, really, but accept the consequences. That's it. If your actions warrant 
reprisal and anger and hostility from other people, then you should accept it. <laughs> right. And and I tell people, I say, okay, well, somebody will tell me, well, I don't have to follow the non-aggression principle. I say, okay, that's fine. You don't have to follow that. But let me ask you this. Do you place value on your life? Right. So if you came up to me and said, I don't care about the non-aggression principle, now I'm going to ask you, do you place value on your life? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Danilo, do you... Do you place value on your life? Most definitely. Okay. Now, I have placed value on my life. I would like the value that I've placed on my life respected. And I'm sure that you want the value you've placed on your life respected. Well, if you want me to respect the value you've placed on your life, I definitely want you to respect the value that I've placed on my life. So I'm not going to do anything to infringe upon that, and I'm going to communicate with you is to the best of my ability to avoid any unnatural or unnecessary hostility between the two of us because I don't want any conflict with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you agree that that's okay? Would you? Would, are you okay with that? Yeah, definitely. That's and, the non-aggression principle. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's I guess, it. I guess another, another way you can put it is that that's it's uni it's a universalizable concept. We can't all Absolutely. rob each other, rape each other, kill each other, but we can all be non-aggressive toward each other <laughs> right we all want to maintain and improve the quality of our lives and some and people will usually say well what about people who want to commit suicide right. what about it i mean if a dog has if a dog is born with three legs instead of instead of four it's still a dog right mm -hmm. i mean if a human being is born with uh, 11 fingers uh you know six fingers on one hand 10 total mm -hmm. th they're still a human being well we're logically we're logical creatures. Our main asset is our ability to think. It's our cognitive abilities. When somebody is wanting to commit suicide, they're more likely than not depressed or, mm. or something. They're doing whatever is necessary that they can fathom and understand and think through clearly all the way to stop whatever pain it is. And if that pain is to commit suicide, to end it, that's the only clear path they have they can understand. So it's – it doesn't break that philosophy. They're still trying to maintain their life in, or improve its quality. And by committing suicide, that's exactly what they're doing, improving its quality by stopping the pain. It doesn't make sense to us until you're afraid. Mm -hmm. It's kind of – it's the same It's the same thing between people coming up and it's like, well – so like my dad will say, you need to stop this anarchy crap. Stop being so idealistic. <laughs> just, 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 just be quiet. <laughs> And pay your taxes and you won't have trouble. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. So, so he knows that the government has a problem, mm -hmm. but he doesn't want to stand up and address the problem, the actual issue there, which is the uh, the violence inherent in the system. It's the it's the unspoken the violence that that's always the underlying violence that's always there because if we don't obey, they pull the gun on us and take us to jail mm -hmm. if we're lucky. And that's and that's something that everybody wants to maintain their lives. Everybody wants that. People are going to end up abiding by the non-aggression principle regardless uh, unless they're under some, in some state of duress or, or despair. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's very interesting when people <laughs> say, you know, call um, anarchists, you know, utopian, idealistic. Or even worse, you're a threat to society. <laughs> uh, the supreme, the supreme irony is the state is calling the anarchist a threat to society. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's it's it's just, I, yeah, I got nothing for that. <laughs> I, I I really I, I really that, and that's something else. A lot of people get upset about all this, and there's a lot of angry people. And I I was angry for a long time about it. Mm. I learned that creation is the key. You have to create. Create either for yourself, create connections with others to help yourself, which helps them. I mean the key is to, to create, and if we don't create what we want to see in this world, and all we're going to do is be bitter about everything that we do see. Because if we don't like something, why tear it down? Create something that everybody else wants to strive for. Mm -hmm. Create something to show them, like yeah. the 3D printers. I mean – the only people who are hating the 3D printers are the people who currently have businesses vested in producing the things that are now going to be able to be easily manufactured with 3D printers. It's it's, it's just <laughs> going to be – I think I think you mentioned this the other day on one of your programs where you said something about – or maybe it was an older one about the 
horse and buggy carriages and stuff like that uh, yeah. going striking against the automobile makers, you know, <laughs> uh, putting up wanting laws and regulations. Or, or maybe yours was the, uh, the, the candle makers and, and the electric light bulbs and stuff like that. I don't right. know. But, yeah, yeah same, 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 same concept, yeah. Right. You know, why, why be afraid of this sort of stuff here? Because it's just going to improve the quality of our lives. So what? We stop working and doing and earning a living doing whatever we're doing. The threat is not making our lives easier. The threat is always going to be those who want to tear down the things in the world that they don't like, regardless of whether they understand them or not. Those are always the threats. And it's it's the one thing I think all of those people have in common is they, they don't know how to break down concepts well enough or are willing to look at the fact that they need to break down those concepts and understand that they need to do something different. And I think that's going to be that's going to be a, a fundamental issue here is just people making time to self reflect and understand these things. But it's just easier to yell at somebody and, and still fear and like, damn, I'm going to make you pay for it if you don't want to. And that's hmm. not necessary. Yeah, yeah, you just you, you just reminded me of all these different stories of conquering empires that invade foreign lands and that that have slowly and meticulously developed you know knowledge and books and information and then they just go in there and just destroy everything destroy monuments destroy statues and buildings and and destroy libraries and books and i think jengis kind of did the same thing conquering uh, central asia and it and just to to think how much knowledge and information has been destroyed. I think from the Library of Alexandria, right? I think the Romans, right? How much information has been destroyed? How much that has set back possible progress, right? Mm -hmm. Where would we have been today if those if those bits of information were still with us? Uh, what would we have known? You know, it's just oh, it, mm -hmm. it really, <laughs> and knowledge is power. The more you know how to create. The more power you're going to have, and that's and I did a I just did an episode a, a couple of weeks ago about knowledge is power concerning that subject, and creation is always going to be superior to destruction because at the end of the day, who's going to be beholden to who? Who's going to have to look to somebody else when there's nothing left to confiscate, when there's nothing left to consume, when there's nothing left to destroy? Who then is the master? The person or the individual who understands how to create what everybody else wants. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. always going to be the case, and when we have when we have the ability to create, whoever is able to create and, and supply the supply the uh, demand that everybody has, that's going to change. That's going to change the name of the game for everything, and they're going to have the power. They're going to have the loyalty. They're going to have the the, the followers, mm -hmm. not the people who are raising the raising the, the sword or the truncheon or, the, or or pointing a gun, you know. And I, and I think too many people are quick to, 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 to raise a sword instead of push a plow. <laughs> I just, it's, right. sometimes it's disheartening. But then there's people like you and um, you <laughs> out there <laughs> in the world. Uh, so that's very much appreciated. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, uh, yeah, I definitely appreciate what you're doing as well. Um, and yeah, it, it really, you know, it's like to, to think that, you know, there's this um, idea that's taught in history books, especially in government school history books of, you know, let's say Alexander the Great, he cleared the pathways, he opened trade routes, he merged these two civilizations, you know, he brought about trade, look what he did, he unified this. And like we look at the Euro, Euro, Eurozone, right? They're, they're unified. And, and I remember learning about Hitler, watching a documentary about him, and they were saying that if he had won World War II, and he, you know, he was invading all these countries, Poland, different countries, and he had consolidated those countries and he created a huge German empire. We would be reading how he's such a wonderful thing, how he's such a wonderful person akin to Alexander the Great. <laughs> but no, he lost. Therefore, he's the enemy. And and so it's the idea of this, this guy, you know, this guy, Dan Carlin, he makes a uh, hardcore history podcast and uh, he talks mm. about these conquerors in history and he calls them historical arsonists where mm. he says there's that that uh, civilization civilizations become decadent and desiccated and dry and they need somebody this one spark this one conqueror who comes along and just lights put you know adds a little spark and it and it raises everything to the ground and allows for new fresh shoots of of another civilization 
And I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know if I buy that. <laughs> it's like it's like it's, yeah, de- it's defending know. defending the pillage and rape and murder of millions of people because you think that their civilization is decadent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't like that. It, it, it just it, it's it holds people back from 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 raising the pinnacle of their personal and collective and and social successes. I, I just don't. I'm not sure I like that the example. And, right. I mean, well, what got us out of World War II? It wasn't the fact that uh, it wasn't the fact that the, the, the government spent all this money. No, it was the fact that so much stuff was destroyed, and the jobs. The, the, we were already the United States was already in a depression, mm-hmm. and why why was there almost near 100 percent employment when when people came back from the war in the United States? Because how many how many thousands of people died? In that conflict, right. that's why there was right. near 100 percent employment because there were not enough people right. to fill the jobs that were left vacant because they went and picked up a rifle mm-hmm. to go shoot somebody in some faraway land that they had never met before. Yeah. That's why there was that. That's what. That's why people have this illusion about destroying stuff creates jobs. I mean, my God. I mean, uh, Japan just had another another earthquake or, or whatever it was, and and if they had, I, I haven't heard anything recently about it, but. Uh, I mean, if they get if a city gets leveled over there, that's not going to create and change anything. It's just going to mean they're going to rebuild what they already had. It's a loss. It's a massive loss of of real wealth that mm-hmm. would satisfy their, their their need for sustenance and shelter and security and just hold them back. What? It's not what we see. It's what we don't see. Mm-hmm. And if we, and if we can't see the fact that that the, all the what ifs all those people could create if they didn't have to recreate everything that was once there. We're just holding ourselves back. So I don't know. I don't know if I agree with with <laughs> with, with, with that with that uh, the fellow's assessment. Like, just raise everything and start over. That's, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It seems a little leftist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he's he's a very interesting historian. He does awesome podcasts. But yeah, he does have a little bit of a status bent to it. But um, but yeah. So it is it is good food for food. Right? Say again. We all start somewhere, right? Right. It's food for thought. Uh, but uh, but yeah, wonderful conversation. Um, Jim, we will continue this uh, uh, again. Uh, I think for our next uh, talk, we're going to we we're thinking about talking about peace and why why um, focusing on that and uh, encouraging that is important. So we will uh, looking forward to that conversation. So so yeah, before we go, please uh, plug your websites and how people can reach you if they want to fo- follow your work. Oh, well, thank you. Um so, well, I run jimlimberdavis.com. I post all of my work there. Uh, you can find me on YouTube. Uh, just look for Jim Limber Davis. I do a, uh, I do also also a, a audio program, uh, Liberty and Morality Defined Presents. Uh, you can find me at uh, on Facebook at uh, Liberty Defined, and also uh, at Jim Limber Davis. Um, and then I'm also on Steam at Jim Limber Davis, and on Twitter as well. So, if you have questions, comments, concerns, just hit me up on any of those. Uh, those locations there. Uh, I don't serve food, so don't ask for snacks. <laughs> food for thought. That's that's what we say. Ah. <laughs> More important nourishment. Uh, but yeah, please follow his work. He's doing some great stuff. He posts on my page. Adds some wonderful value. Um, I think he does a lot of work and a lot of great work. So we gotta support each other in the in the you know especially as content creators. It's not easy. You know we don't make real currency off of this um, as much as we would like <laughs> but we do it because we have a, a burning smoldering passion to spread um, freedom liberty and volunteerism throughout the land um, you know we want to k- take over the world to leave you alone right <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I don't know if i want to take over the world i just kind of want to be left alone <laughs> right <laughs> right it's funny but uh but yeah so if anybody wants to help me out you can do so through um uh, patreon or Bitcoin and PayPal also links are below um, patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism if you uh, to help me out if you really find value in what I do please support me a dollar show is all I ask you know for in- interviewing fascinating people like like Jim here to encourage me to continue doing more of these you know, as, we, as you know we all respond to incentives uh, we are capitalists in the end and so uh, free time is never really free right it always co- comes at an opportunity cost we are sacrificing what we could have done to do this and so uh, monetary compensation is always appreciated and encouraged thanks a lot Jim for coming on the Absolutely. show really appreciate it so this is uh, Peace Finicism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty.com and the Conscious Resistance.com wishing all of you have a wonderful day take care bye <laughs>